Okay, I think we're really set up now to uh, move right into our guest speaker for today, who is a flight systems engineer at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Yes, she, in her 15 years at JPL, she's participated in the development and the operation of the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Just now in orbit at Mars. Mm. A Kepler. A mission that searches for new exoplanets in our galaxy and Juno, which is currently on its way to Jupiter, slated to arrive in July of this year. So basically, um, she's our kind of Miss Universe. Yes. <laughs> Mano, welcome to the stage. Keep the applause going for Tracy Drain. I could not have asked for a better introduction than that. <laughs> and this, the, most of the facts in there were accurate, the ones that I know about anyway. You're gonna see one of them later on in this presentation. So here we go. I have an awful lot of information to share with you guys in the 15 minutes that I have. So hopefully I won't get going really, really fast and just hope you all keep up with me until the end of the slide. So if I end up talking this fast, you can't follow me, just raise your hand and like ask me to slow down and I will do that. <laughs> So here we go, flight system engineer, you heard all about me, so let's move on to the fun stuff about Kepler finding planets. Next slide. So the first thing I'm going to tell you about is how Kepler goes about looking for planets, because it is surprisingly simple. If you guys were all in a spaceship looking back in at our solar system and you were looking at the sun, if Jupiter passed in front of the sun, it would block about 1% of the light. If the Earth passed in front of the sun, it would block about 0.01% of the light because we're smaller. Now, if you were staring at a car headlight and a gnat flew by, you were trying to see that the gnat went by, that's kind of what it would be like if you were looking at your naked eye. That's hard to do. And so we need to get a instrument to measure the amount of light that's falling on its CCD, kind of like the charge coupled device you have in your phone. Measure that and then you can see the dip in brightness when something's in front of the star and you wanna see that go by, you need to see it go by not just twice, but three times at least with the same amount of time separated between them. And then you know something's actually orbiting the star in a regular pattern and it wasn't just a speck of dust really close to you that went by and you thought that was a planet. So you need to see things multiple times. And if you guys were outside the solar system looking into the Earth and you saw the Earth pass in front of the sun, it would take a year to go around and do it again, another year to go around and do it again. So if you looked at one star, you'd have to wait a long time and then switch stars, wait a long time, switch stars. That would take forever. So we're not doing that. What we're doing is looking at more than 100,000 stars all at once looking for this dip of light so that we can try to find planets. Now, you can't see any planet. If a planet was circling my head this way, it would never cross my head, and so you wouldn't see it. It needs to be in this plane. Maybe it can be tilted a little bit. So of all the planets that are out there, we know that we're only gonna see something like 5% of them just because of the random distribution of how the orbits are angled. So Kepler's looking for other planets outside of our solar system, still inside our Milky Way galaxy, and not just any old planets. We want to know if they're Earth-sized. Are Earth-sized planets common or rare? And are they in the habitable zone around their star? We'll talk about that in a second. Next slide. So what is a habitable planet anyway? Well, there's lots of different kinds of Earth form or life forms that could be out there, Klingons on Star Trek or whatever there is on Star Wars, those cool things, plan instruments and they get whatever. There could be all sorts of stuff out there, microbial life forms, whatever. But for us, whenever we see life here on Earth, whether it's extremophiles living at hydrothermal vents in the deep ocean, whether it's extremophiles that are living buried under ice in the Arctic, the thing that they have in common is water, mostly. There are some weird things out there that may not need water, but mostly it's water. And so what we want to know about these planets are, are they close enough to their stars that it's warm enough that water could be liquid on the surface, but not so hot that it would be vaporized like if you were at Mercury, far enough away that liquid water could be liquid and not frozen into ice. Now there's different kinds of stars out there. You have these really hot, bright stars, you have to be farther back from those to be in the habitable zone. That's what that top one is. If you have dim red dwarf stars, you need to be closer in, just like a campfire that's died down. 
So range from the stars is, is when one of the key things. The other key thing is size of the planet. If you're too small, you can't hold on to any atmosphere, and then all the radiation from your star is probably going to fry everything on the surface. If you're too big, you're going to hold on to lots and lots of hydrogen gases, those kinds of things, and you'll turn into a gas giant like Jupiter or Saturn, where there's no ground, or if there is ground down there, it's under this huge amount of atmosphere that's squishing everything. So you need to be the right size, somewhere between you know, Earth size, half Earth size, to about two times the size of the Earth, roughly. So size, distance from star. Next. So here's the cool thing about Kepler. I meant to do this before I got up here, and I totally forgot about it. But who's ever heard of an app called Google Sky? Raise your hand for me. Raise it high and keep it high. Oh, good, lots of you, yes. No, no, keep your hand up, keep it up, keep it up. People who do not have Google Sky, look around. <laughs> Find one of these people afterwards, have them help you load it onto your phone. You will love it. It is my favorite app in the entire world. Basically, when you put it onto your phone, it makes your phone act like a window onto the universe. And as you move your phone around, it's labeling constellations. It'll label where the planets are. So you can find all sorts of stuff. Kepler is looking at a single spot in the sky about the size of the palm of your hand held up against the sky in the Summer Triangle constellation, also Cygnus the Swan. And that's what it looks like in Google Sky. If you want to know where everything I'm about to tell you about is located, it's in that spot in the sky, and you can find it with Google Sky. That's a picture of the spacecraft, and then a picture of that 95 megapixel CCD array that we use to collect the light and look for planets. Next. So this is an artist's conception of our Milky Way galaxy, since we have not been able to get out there and take a picture back at us. We do not have a photo stick that that's that, that long. <laughs> so, so here we are in our Milky Way galaxy. We are in the Orion Spur of the Sagittarius arm. And as Kepler is looking out into that single spot in the sky, it's looking along the Orion Spur. In a distance, the stars that we're looking at are like spread out around 3,000 light years. So zero, not really zero, more like 100 to 3,000 light years is where these stars are located. And now, Thinking about Kepler, I was looking at over 100,000 stars. What I'm about to tell you about is based on four years of data. I want you to think about how many planets you think Kepler may have found in the data that it gathered over four years. I'll give you five seconds. Have a guess. I'm not going to make you tell me what it is. <laughs> And that's it. So the next slide, and we're going to work up to it a little bit. So the next one shows you what that field of view looks like against the stars. If we can advance one. There we go. And when we launched the spacecraft, we needed to make sure that there were at least one, we picked three, transiting planets, meaning that they're angled such that they would cross between their star and our spacecraft in the field of view. Because if we didn't, and then we didn't see any, the scientists might have concluded there weren't any planets, when really maybe the instrument was broken. <laughs> so we had to make sure that there were some in there that were really close to their stars so that their orbits, their entire year, is only two to five days. So they would pop right out in the first few weeks of data, and they totally did. We saw them. It worked. We were very happy that our spacecraft was doing the thing that it should do. There we knew about other exoplanets, non-transiting from other methods, but those are the three that were in our little patch of sky in the summer triangle. And then the next slide will show you, as of January, 13, or January 7th, 2013, this is based on almost four years worth of data, this looks like you took one of those containers full of sprinkles for donuts and just went <laughs> right, all over the field of view. And they're colored now by Earth size, super Earth size, up to two times the size of the Earth, Neptune size and Jupiter size, like spread all over the field of view. There's 2,740 planets in that set of data. Now, unfortunately for Kepler, it was working fine. It had some kind of dicey reaction wheels. We need three out of four to work, and the second one died in May of 2012. But the scientists have four years' worth of data on hand, and they can keep getting fancy with the way they're analyzing the data and pulling out fainter and fainter signals from it. So the next slide, just um, as of January 6, 2015, this now shows you the 3,892 planets that they had pulled out of that data arrayed by the size of the planets. And you can see Earth-sized ones, about 800, 1,200, up to two times the size of the Earth, 1,500 Neptune-sized ones. They're not sure why that one seems to be a little more frequent than the others. And then Jupiter-sized ones, 260, even ones that are up to 25 times the radius of Jupiter. Scientists really didn't quite think that planets could get that big. <laughs> they, they had to kind of revise their theory of planet formation to understand that. And the next slide 
Actually, this is the highest total as of today, 4,696 planets that Kepler has seen in its data. Now, that's the dip in light that they have in the information that they have. They've done follow-up observations to confirm them with other telescopes on the ground of about 1,030. So based on that 5,000 number, who, who was within like two times? Yay, we've got one here, we've got one here. Did you guys just know about Kepler already? You just guessed. Yes, you were right. Psychic. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> so, so the one cool thing about this slide is that it's starting to give you some information about the size of these planets um, relative to each other and also about the orbital period. Your orbital period is how long it takes you to go around your star. It takes the Earth 365 days to go all the way around. This is a logarithmic scale, so it can be a little bit weird to look at. at if you look at the 100, the one tick over is 200. The next tick over is... 300 and so on. So you can see that the more data we gather, you start to see more planets that are smaller and more planets that have longer years, which makes sense because the longer year, the longer you have to wait for it to go around. So you need a good long set of data to pull these out. It was very heartbreaking when Kepler's second reaction wheel died, but at least we got the four years worth of data and all this fabulousness has come out of it. Next slide. So now I'm going to go through a sampling of some of Kepler's really cool discoveries. Going back in time, the first rocky planet that Kepler discovered was Kepler 10b, and I'll describe the naming convention. It's not very imaginative, but <laughs> it, there's some basis behind it. But uh, Kepler 10b is the first rocky planet 20 times closer to its star than Mercury is to our sun. It is so hot that the scientists think it probably is more like a rocky comet trailing silica flex that had been blasted off the surface by the sun. So not exactly a place we want to go and build a summer home, but it's cool to know that it's out there, right? The, one of the cool planets is Kepler-16, which is orbiting a binary system star, a big yellow star and a much smaller dwarf companion with that purple planet orbiting both of us. So Star Wars, eat your heart out. That's the real Tatooine, right? <laughs> And then there's Kepler-11, which was very exciting, because that was a system that has six planets. Now we're starting to find things that look like solar systems out there, so that was very exciting. And two of those, Kepler-11b B and 11e, are not that much bigger than the Earth. They're like somewhere between Earth and Neptune size. And then Kepler-20 is a star that had five planets. Two of them are small, rocky planets that are really in the size range of the Earth and Venus. But they're all super close into their star. You can see the habitable zone is that purple range out there. They're way, way, way close down in there. The next slide is going to tell you about some of the habitable zone planets that Kepler has found. The upper left one is the Kepler-22 system, where scientists were very excited because it was the very first planet that was kind of our size, is about twice the size of the Earth, that's in the habitable zone, snugged in close to the inner edge of its habitable zone. Over to the right is the Kepler-62 system that has five planets, two of which are in the habitable zone. Very exciting. And Kepler-62 has a type K2 star. For those of you who aren't like all soaking in weird factoids about the universe and how scientists describe things, if you've ever heard the phrase, oh, be a fine girl, kiss me, that is how scientists remember the the size and, and color of stars. You're big and hot if you're O, oh, be a fine girl, kiss me, is how we get down to the end. The knees are like the, the red ones, right? So we're a class G2 star ourselves, so they were excited that 22 was around a type G, even though it's G5. And 62, you can see it's a smaller star. And then the bottom left is Kepler, where's my label? Oh, 186. And the scientists were the most excited about 186. You can see how close it is to the size of the Earth. It's around a, a smaller star, a type M cooler star. It's, um, very, it's close enough that they thought for a while this is the closest one that we have that is like an Earth's mirror. But the sad thing is they found out, they started learning later more about that star's qualities. They think it puts out a huge amount of radiation. And with that planet being so close in, it probably is getting blasted on the surface. Boo. Kepler-452 is the one they found after that, which now they consider to be the closest Earth's cousin that we have out there. It's the same kind of star as ours, type G5. Its day is only 20 days longer than ours. The sun is only 10% brighter than ours. And so even though it is 1,400 and light years away, <laughs> that's the planet that we know is the most like Earth so far. Next slide. 
So this is all of the small habitable zone planets that Kepler knows about right now. There's about a dozen of them. You'll notice that Kepler-22 is not in this list because it is a little over twice the size of the Earth, so it did not quite make the cut. But you can see 452b there with the details I was just talking about. So from class G stars, class K, class M, there's several planets of the lower two types that are Earth size in the habitable zone around their star. And again, all of this information is from a little patch of sky about the size of the palm of your hand up against the um, summer triangle. Next slide. So now, here's again your picture of the Milky Way. Based on Kepler's results, the scientists are estimating that, one click, there are at least 100 billion planets in our Milky Way galaxy. You might remember that, that number, 100 billion, from the song <laughs> before. So on average, there is a planet for every star. That doesn't mean every star has a planet. Some have none, some have six, as we've seen. But on average, there's a planet for every star. So at least 100 billion planets in our galaxy. Next slide, or next click. So 14 billion of those are probably Earth-sized um, and in the habitable zone. So think about that for a second. Two planets for every person on Earth that is habitable and in the habitable zone. Next click. And out of those, a billion of those are probably orbiting a type G2 star the same as ours. So maybe not getting blasted by a red giant spitting out lots of radiation, but around a nice, well-behaved star <laughs> like ours. And next, the next click, in, in case those numbers are hard for you to really think about, if on the day you were born, somehow you could count, and you counted one, two, three, every second for your entire life, you would not reach one billion until you were 32 years old. I personally am one and a quarter billion years, or seconds, <laughs> old myself, to kind of help you get a feel for just the sheer scale of the numbers we're talking about here. So when you go outside, last click, and look up into the night sky, and you see all those stars, well, when you get away from LA and go someplace darker, <laughs> look up into the night sky, and you see all those stars, you can think to yourself, it's not just stars out there. There are planets everywhere you look. Our galaxy is juicy with planets. It's dripping with planets. They're just everywhere. And that's just one measly little galaxy. There are at least 100 billion galaxies in our universe, too, and we have no reason to think that any of them are going to be any different. So I'll leave you with that this morning. <laughs>